Okay. Uh, good evening, students. Uh, we are meeting after a long gap, and I'm sure that you must have practiced well the diagram of the human digestive system, the elementary canal. Uh, in the last video, I think we did a good step-by-step -step practice, and now you're ready to come to the functioning and the working of the human digestive system. So, a very quick review. I think whenever we are dealing with the human organs and organ systems and their working, you know, we relate to our own body pretty well. And usually we have diagrams drawn in books. So it's very interesting to notice that maybe you are interested to know what actually these organs look like. Like what does a pancreas look like? What does a liver look like? What do the salivary glands look like? So I thought today... I'll try to make this lecture as relatable as possible and try to show you the actual images of certain organs and glands which are involved in the human nutrition process. So, last time we have seen that the human elementary canal um, is basically the long passage extending from the mouth till the anus and the entire five step process of ingestion, then digestion, and then absorption, assimilation, egestion happens along the different areas of the digestive system and the elementary canal. But there are certain glands which are associated with the elementary canal. The three main glands which are associated are the salivary glands, the pancreas, and the liver. So the salivary glands are located in the oral cavity or the buccal cavity or the mouth. We have essentially three paired glands. These are the major salivary glands and they produce the saliva. So if you can memorize it like that, that salivary glands produce saliva. And saliva is a very important secretion of these glands because they contain enzymes like lyso Zines, which have antimicrobial action. They include very important enzymes like salivary amylase, which help in the breakdown of starch and complex carbohydrates in our oral cavity itself. Ever wondered that if you chew on a piece of Indian bread or rice or bread for constantly one minute, you feel the taste changing. No longer is the flat bread flat. It tastes sweeter. Ever wondered why? Because remember, salivary amylase is involved in the uh, you know breakdown of the complex sugars like starch into simple sugars like maltose and you know, like glucose, etc., etc., etc. So I hope that you are clear that salivary glands are going to help in the secretion of salivary amylase, lysozymes, and uh, a number of important ions are also a part and parcel of this watery secretion called saliva because these ions help in the maintenance of an almost neutral pH. What is a pH? pH is the potential or power of hydrogen ions and of course the three major paired glands are the parotid, submandibular and the sublingual and their positions are exactly marked in the diagram wherever my mouse cursor is moving. So the parotid gland is you know located just towards the cheek region in front of the ears you can say. So the submandible is along the jawline or the mandible. Sub means below and mandible is this lower jaw line and sublingual. So sub again means below or lower and lingual from tongue. So just beneath the tongue. So these are located towards the left hand side as well as the right hand side. So we say that we have three pairs of each of these glands associated with these three major glands and pairs we have many minor salivary glands as well beyond the scope of class 10 for now.
So all these salivary glands are giving us the watery secretion called saliva and saliva you know is very important it helps in digestion of starch helps you know has antimicrobial activity you know the ions help maintain a neutral ph and they provide lubrication in the mouth so you are able to you know when you chew your food and saliva mixes with it the texture of the food changes right it becomes clumpy the next pair of glands so not the pair of course the next gland associated are the pancreas and the pancreas are located in the abdominal region just behind the stomach now what is interesting about the pancreas is that they have a dual function they are exocrine as well as endocrine which brings us to two new terms so biology is all about terms and you got to enjoy it so what do these terms mean? so basically a gland is a body part of an organ which is secreting some juices some enzymes it has some secretion so it's a gland now how are the secretions being released are the secretions being released via a duct or a tube well that would make it an exocrine gland but if the juices or the secretions are being released directly into the blood stream that would be an endocrine gland <coughs> excuse me so pancreas are special they have a dual nature they are exocrine as well as endocrine they release two hormones and right now we are not discussing about the hormones but i'm just telling you they release two hormones directly into the blood stream from a group of special cells present in the pancreas so that makes pancreas endocrine but as far as digestion is concerned and the pancreatic juices and enzymes which help in digestion are concerned they are released via the pancreatic duct and of course the pancreatic duct drains into the duodenum the smallest and the first part of the small intestine okay. and of course the last major gland associated with the alimentary canal is the liver what is interesting about the liver is that it is located towards the right hand side of the abdomen and it is the largest gland in our body okay and of course the liver produces a greenish juice or liquid called the bile and this bile has a number of bile salts and some enzymes and this bile is stored in an associated structure called the gall bladder so many a times we can say that the liver and the gall bladder together they can be associated as one gland system the liver produces bile bile has bile salts and certain enzymes and certain pigments and this bile is then stored into the associated gall bladder then of course the bile duct and the pancreatic duct they merge they form the hepato pancreatic duct and they drain their juices into the small intestine or the duodenum so i am sure that now you find the structures and the location of the salivary glands in the oral cavity the pancreas this is what an actual extracted pancreas looks like so so i hope you find the organ relatable now and this my dear my dears these are this is this is your liver and uh, you can see that the liver has a lobed structure like it is divided into compartments and it is the largest gland and i hope um, these images have made the mental association with these glands better for all of us so today our main aim is to discuss the functioning of the human digestive system and the alimentary canal because in the last class we have already discussed this diagram and we have tried and practiced the ncrt diagram as well which is very important from the examination point of view but as far as the entire process of nutrition is concerned 
I really like to divide the entire process of nutrition in humans into these seven main steps, you can say. Exactly, we want to know in which part of the elementary canal, with what associated gland, what part of the nutrition is taking place, where is ingestion taking place, where is digestion happening, what kind of enzymes are involved, and where is absorption and assimilation happening, and finally, the last step, ingestion or, you know, ejecting out the waste from the body. So, let's do the process step by step. So, in the mouth or the oral cavity, Majorly, we have the salivary glands. We have already discussed the parotid, sublingual, submandibular. And we know that they secrete the saliva. Saliva has salivary amylase. What does salivary amylase do? It breaks down starch into simple sugars like maltose. Right? What are the other parts in our mouth or oral cavity? Well, right now, just use your tongue. Roll it around in your mouth and feel the teeth. Do you feel your teeth? Well, the teeth are meant for grinding, biting, and chewing. So basically, they are involved in the crushing of the food into tinier segments. So the mechanical grinding and crushing and the mastication of food happens by the teeth. The tongue helps in, the tongue is like a surface, which, you know, acts like a surface for this entire process to happen as well as the tongue has a number of taste buds and of course each taste bud has a gustatory receptor when we say gustatory we are talking about taste taste buds right so you feel your food is sweet sour bitter salty um do a fun activity find the diagram of the tongue in which you have those areas demarcated you know you feel the sweetness, where do you feel the bitterness, where do you feel the sourness and the saltiness, so that would be your activity. Draw those diagrams and WhatsApp me the images in our closed group. Okay, so th these are the various steps which are happening in the mouth or the oral cavity. Now the texture of food has changed. Now the food is not like the chewable bite that you took food is sticky with saliva, it is crushed, it is ground into smaller particles. Now it's like a ball of food. And this ball of food has to roll down the food pipe or the esophagus. So how does the food roll down? So the food rolls down into the esophagus and this happens by a series of rhythmic contractions. So, the esophagus undergoes some special peristaltic movements, right? I have just brought you the image of peristalsis. So, if we look at this one small section of the esophagus, if this is the bolus or the food ball, which is now moving down, constantly the walls of the esophagus, they contract and then they relax and that is how the bolus is pushed down. The ball of food is pushed down, right? So, I hope uh, this image gives you some clarity that how constant rhythmic contractions and relaxations help to push down the food bolus, right? So, this is very important. This key word is there in fact present in the NCRT text. Go ahead and learn its definition as well. And finally, the food now reaches this bag-like structure or organ called the stomach. Right? That is very important to know that throughout the different portions of the elementary canal, the food has to stay for some time in the different portions and parts of the elementary canal. For example, the food has to stay for about 1 to 2 minutes in your mouth for proper grinding, mastication and conversion to bolus. Then it will take some time through peristalsis throughout the esophagus to reach down the stomach. Then it has to remain in the stomach for approximately 1 to 4 hours perhaps depending upon what kind of food material you have ingested etc. So this is also very important that the food that you have ingested will be spending different time duration intervals in each part of the elementary canal or each organ right, for the proper nutritional process to be achieved. 
and of course when you want the food to remain to enter and then remain in an organ you need some control over it so another ncert keyword is given which is a sphincter so sphincters are basically circular muscles which basically let food move in and then remain in that organ or area or in that passage and these sphincters you can imagine them to be like gates they open and they close so these are basically the circular muscular rings which normally help constrict or demarcate the food for a specific amount of time in certain areas of the elementary canal so sphincters are present um, at the start of the stomach at the end of the stomach the beginning of the small intestine etc etc if you are interested you can know more from trusted internet sources sky is the limit of course as far as great pen is concerned what you need to know is that these sphincters are basically helping in the regulation and the intervals the staying of the food for proper digestion in those areas okay so they allow the entry and the exit and the stay now we want to know what happens in the stomach the stomach is releasing some very important secretions or juices called the gastric juices have you ever heard of this term gastro nomi or um anything with uh, you know a, a gastronomic journey so wherever this term gastro appears it should hit you we are talking of the stomach right so the juices of the stomach the secretions of the stomach the special cells present in the, in the stomach you have the gastric juices so what are the three main components so there are three types of cells each are having three different kinds of gastric secretions the first is an enzyme by the name of pepsin well technically the original enzyme is pepsinogen so pepsinogen is the inactive enzyme and of course when hcl is secreted by another group of cells so hydrochloric acid acid guys and girls everyone acid means that the ph or power of hydrogen ions will increase so the acidic ph will develop because of the hydrochloric acid and in the presence of this acidic ph the inactive enzyme pepsinogen becomes activated to the active enzyme pepsin and pepsin is involved in protein digestion so i have already told you in previous online tutorials that enzymes are biological catalysts which are proteins by nature and they are very specific proteases will break down proteins amylases will break down carbohydrates so you are seeing that in different parts of the elementary canal different biomolecules of the food are being digested and taken care of so pepsin is involved in the breakdown of proteins and of course hydrochloric acid which is a part of these gastric juices makes the medium acidic and why we need the acidic medium again ncert textbook very important question which is very commonly asked and what is the role of an acidic ph in the stomach or what role is hcl play so number 1 this acidic ph is required for the activation of pepsinogen to pepsin for protein digestion and of course this acidic ph also helps curtail um harmful microbes so it has an anti microbe action and of course why don't the tissue linings of the stomach get corroded such a strong acid being secreted because a protective structure a protective secretion uh, you know you know it, it it envelops and it guards the inner lining of the stomach against the corrosive effect of the hcl or the hydrochloric acid and this is called the mucus so the mucus is a secretion which is acting like a buffer it is acting like an insulation against the corrosive action of the hcl so if you could remember the small flow chart that these are the three important components of the gastric juices what are their roles this will be very helpful during your examination time and then of course by this time 
the food has completely changed its form now the food is in the form of a semi liquid it's acidic and it is now entering the small intestine or the duodenum and over here of course you also have the pouring of the hepatopancreatic duct and all the pancreatic juices and bile are being poured over here so that brings us to a very interesting part which is what all is happening in the small intestine what all is happening in duodenum jejunum and ileum right the three parts of the small intestine so we know already from the previous slide that you know liver is involved in the secretion of bile bile is a greenish liquid which is carrying bile salts certain pigments and basically these bile salts you know they help in the breakdown of fats so a very interesting phenomena is the emulsification of fats the breakdown of the big large fat droplet drops or globules into small droplets which can further be acted upon by the lipases which of course break down these small fat droplets into fatty acids and finally glycerol uh, and glycerin so keep that in mind that we are talking about the breakdown process over here so pancreas are releasing their pancreatic juice so typically when this mixture reaches duodenum this is now called the intestinal juice right so what are the various components you have a number of enzymes again you have certain amylases lipases um you know you have trypsin trypsin is an enzyme which again you know breaks down proteins into peptones smaller subunits of proteins lipases you know they break down they act upon the emulsified or the smaller fat droplets and convert them into fatty acids and glycerol and now from the examination point of view what you have to focus upon is this this is a very important board question even for ntsc students it's important and what is this process of emulsification so emulsification is just the breakdown of large flat globules because of the presence of bile salts in the bile juice into smaller fat droplets or globules which can be then acted upon by the lipases and then finally the fats are broken down to fatty acids and glycerol so please remember these key words and which enzymes are involved in the breakdown etc etc so what we are seeing is that the entire process of digestion is almost coming to an end in small intestine you don't have any digestion happening beyond the small intestine and ultimately the small intestine it merges and we can say um it joins into the large intestine which is the colon if so you have the the ascending colon you have the transverse colon and you have the sigma uh, the descending colon ultimately the large intestine it ends into the rectum and the anus so what is the role of the large intestine now the large intestine is doing some very important functions so before that i would like to show you this diagram why this diagram it is very sum summarizing in effect so you can clearly see the different power of hydrogen ions the different potential of hydrogen ion values in the different parts of the elementary canal for example saliva in the oral cavity is at a neutral ph 6.5 to 7.5 and food has to stay in the mouth for approximately a minute of course then in the upper stomach you have the range very acidic because of hcl approximately 4 to 6.5 then in the lower stomach the, the range of um, acidity falls further because of stronger action of hcl you have ph going as low as 1.5 as well and in the stomach the food has to take an average time of 1 to 3 to 4 hours and of course then the duodenum has now the ph is rising 7 to 8.5 so now the ph is going towards the basic scale 
alkaline scale and then of course it goes ahead now the food is going to you know be convert is already in the form of fine um and it is semi liquid and this entire process can take approximately up to 5 hours and of course in the large intestine again 10 hours to several days now this is very interesting so which brings us to the fact uh, that the small intestine is merging into the large intestine this this point of connection this is this called the cecum now um what are the major roles of the large intestine of course it is not taking part in any digestion that has been accomplished in up to the small intestine right from the mouth to the small intestine the process of breakdown of the complex food components into smaller simpler substances by, by different enzymes at different ph ranges has been accomplished now we are more concerned about what are the functions of the large intestine so number one the large intestine is involved in a lot of water reabsorption and electrolytes salts so a lot of water will be reabsorbed back right number two those parts of the food like fiber for which we don't have any enzymes for digestion so the fiber will remain undigested so with some other components i guess so that undigested part of the food has to be eliminated now right and something very interesting is that there are certain bacteria which are present towards the area of the vermiform appendix and these bacterial colonies they help in producing substantial amounts of vitamins like biotin vitamin k and they are again you know absorbed back into the blood so let's remember fun facts that um to have a healthy gut bacteria or bacteria in your digestive tract can also improve your health so what kind of bacteria are these how are they producing these vitamins these vitamins are very important for our body uh, proper functioning etc etc all this you can study i guess um, if you want to gain more knowledge and uh, many drugs many medicines um many therapeutic uh, agents are also reabsorbed in the area of the large intestine so that's it um you need to know that now a very important uh, concept is that apart from digestion what else is happening in the small intestine remember the steps of absorption and assimilation okay the food has been broken down into smaller units and simpler substances but then this food needs to be like the smaller units the smaller monomeric units need to be absorbed by the body as well so small intestine is playing a very important role in that i'll just discuss that let me bring you to the ncrt pdf for the same okay so if you covered this part of the text the entire process that we have discussed step wise in the role of hcl what is ph why is ph very variable in different areas what is the sphincter etc 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 what is emulsification etc bile salts etc all of this has been discussed in these um paragraphs and i'm sure you will you have the soft copy of the ncrt text and you will go through it and what we need to understand is that the inner wall the inner lining of the small intestine has a number of numerous finger like projections or villi and what do they do the villi increase the surface area for absorption now these villi or finger like projections are richly supplied with blood vessels they absorb food they ensure that you know nutrition reaches each and every cell and this nutrition is then utilized so we can say that the process of absorption and assimilation is started here in the small intestine and of course then this energy is going to be utilized for repair growth etc 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 and and the unabsorbed food is being sent to the large intestine you now know very well what part of the food what component of food we cannot digest it is the roughage and the fiber the fibrous part mostly and ultimately this undigested material is eliminated from our body 
uh, through the thanus. Right? So basically, rectum allows the collection of the feces or the excrement, and uh, anus allows its ejection or its it being thrown out of the body. Right? So I hope I hope um, all these concepts are clear to you, and uh, now you can go through the NCRT textbook and you will not find it problematic. Last but not the least, there is a very small box information about dental caries. Now that we are talking about um, nutrition in humans, and you know. Well, of course, it all begins with ingestion of different kinds of food. I know all of us are very fond of sweet, sugary items, um, food which has a lot of sugar in it. But you know, one must control sticky and sugary food intake because in the longer run, this is not good for your dental health, the health of your teeth and your gums. So basically... You need to know that your teeth, you, do you know you have four kinds of teeth in your mouth? So the front teeth, so the side teeth, the canines, so you have the incisures, you have the canines, the pointed ones, you have the molar, the premolars and the molars for the chewing and the grinding of the food. And what is interesting is that the teeth. If you take your fingernail and you just click against it, like I'm clicking right now, I don't know if you can hear me. Tuck, tuck, tuck. You, you hear that sound. This is this is a tough tissue called enamel, tooth enamel, and then dentine. Right. Now, what are dental caries? Basically, dental caries is tooth decay. The degradation and the decaying of the teeth softening of the gums, gradual softening of the enamel, the stuff white exterior that you have and the dentine. And how does that happen? Well, essentially, if you are consuming a lot of sugary foods, sweet foods, um, and you do not clean your mouth well, you don't brush and uh, the food particles, the sweet sugar particles are getting trapped in the regions of the teeth and the gums, what would happen is that the bacteria, which is generally present in our mouth, you know, they will start digesting those sugars and as a result, certain acids, harmful acids will be formed. These acids will cause the softening of the enamel, the demineralization, the loss of minerals from the enamel because of which it will lose its strong tough exterior and it will become very soft right? and these bacterial cells they will continue to grow form colonies keep sticking to these chunks of food trapped in your teeth and ultimately these acids will cause softening of the enamel infection by the bacterial colonies in the teeth and the gums foul smell will be emitted from your mouth and the saliva will not be able to neutralize these acids, right? And of course, then the teeth will be covered by a material called the plaque or the plaque. Now, that is why it is very important that timely action is taken and you follow good oral hygiene practices. So, do you brush your teeth at least twice, if not after each meal? Think of that, think of that. But how do you brush? Do you brush, do, do, you, do your tooth uh, brush, uh, bristles go upwards and downwards or do they, do you just, you know, go, make them go harshly sideways? Do you ensure that the tooth brush, the bristles reach each and every orifice or surface of the teeth? And in certain parts where the tooth bristles don't reach, you can use the dental floss. Yes, go and find out what is a dental floss. So flossing and brushing ensures that no unwanted bacteria remains, no food, unwanted food material remains sticking in your mouth. And of course, do you know that if 
the entire dentine is degraded, plaque is formed. These microorganisms or harmful bacteria can infect the softer inner nerves and blood supply, the pulp, the inner material of the teeth. And this causes a lot of pain, a lot of swelling. So inflammation is swelling and infection and pain. So you know, if you have ever heard of dental caries, tooth decay, dental cavities, uh, I'm sure you have uh, you know seen that a lot on the advertisements. Go ahead and find about it. So this is very essential for you to know why we need to have some healthy oral practices. So right now in the YouTube video with this, I need you to answer in the comment section. What is dental floss? Number one. Then I need to know what are willy and micro willy. What role they play in the small intestine? Then I want you to tell me the three types of glands present in the stomach. When, give me the names of the glands which produce mucus. Give me the names of the glands which produce HCL. Give me the names of the glands which produce um, pepsin. Right? And of course, tell me the role of the bile salts. What is emulsification? Last but not the least. Uh, if possible, why do we have these different pH ranges in our different portions and parts of the elementary canal? What significance, what link do you see between the various pH ranges and the enzymatic action? So get going, prepare your lecture well and when this nutrition in humans comes to an end, I am free to receive your queries in the closed WhatsApp group as well as the comment thread below. Take care till next time. Bye-bye.